me thank the, uh, the organizers for the invitation. So today there is, I guess, there is no question what language they should talk. Uh, it it um, has to be in English. Now uh, the the topic I'm I'm going to discuss is uh, is mostly joint work with uh, Alex Kontorovic, and there is also some uh, uh, ongoing work. So the the general uh, the general team uh, is the let's see the the general team is to uh, understand. Uh, sets of integers uh, which are uh, not exactly uh, what you may call standard uh, arithmetical object, objects, but produced uh, in the orbits uh, of linear groups uh, or, say, in the, the orbits of subgroups uh, or uh, sub semi groups of linear, uh, of linear groups. And uh, these are structures which can be purely combinatorial. Uh, purely, uh, combinatorial. So uh, this is a, a team that has been uh, uh, studied uh, for a while uh, in, uh, in different forms. Uh, mainly the initial uh, impetus input uh, was the uh, emerging of uh, a new theory about spectral gaps, which uh, allowed to do uh, sieving uh, in, this, uh, in these creatures. But then this, the, the story has evolved and uh, one got more ambitious and really wanted to understand what integers you get uh, in a given orbit. So what, uh, um, uh, what I will uh, do is uh, give an overview uh, of, uh, of some of these uh, results. I think it is better to give an overview than trying to, give, to, to go into, into more details because I mean, details are quite uh, lengthy and uh, basically I wouldn't be able to say too much and also probably would be lost quite fast. So because I try to, to, to do something which is not too technical, I just want to focus on the, the main ideas and the, uh, the, the methods uh, which are involved. So uh, what I will do is uh, give you a little bit of uh, introductory material and uh, the, the background uh, on the level of uh, the, the techniques which are involved, in particular uh, the results on, uh, on spectral gaps uh, which are uh, involved in, uh, in this theory and also the, the counting methods. And uh, then uh, what I want to discuss are certain applications and there are natural applications uh, as we will see. Uh, there are applications to what is called uh, integral Apollonian circle packings, also to um, uh, problems around uh, uh, rationals uh, with the bounded partial quotients and the Rembas conjecture. And then we have also uh, ongoing work uh, with the Kontorovich uh, which uh, is around uh, Duke's uh, equidistribution theorem uh, in uh, real quadratic fields and uh, the problem of uh, low-lying geodesics. So the first, two, the first two topics will be basically in the context, will, will fit the context of these local to global problems and the last one will be somehow in what, what could look like a natural uh, application of this problem of sieving uh, in, uh, in orbits. So um, let me give you a small reminder. What I want to do is just remind you, since this is supposed to be a, a little bit introductory, so I want to remind you what is the, uh, how the circle method works and why somehow in the present, say, what are the, the elements that allow me in the context of this uh, group or semi-group orbits to perform, uh, to have a chance, say, of performing in a successful way uh, a circle method. So um, basically what we have, well, we would look at a, a set of integers which is produced one or another way, uh, which is a subset, say, of, of 1 up to n. The, the way we'll set it, uh, set it up is, say, we have an, uh, a distribution on 1 up to n, which I will normalize for simplicity to be a probability distribution. And what we are expecting is that it is roughly equidistributed. And then we'd like to say that basically the support of this distribution is almost everybody. So to give you a typical application uh, related to, um, uh, say, related to the Goldbach problem, the binary gold, uh, Goldbach problem, you would look at all integers uh, which can be, uh, let's say, obtained as the average of, of two odd primes uh, bounded by n. And well, one like to say that uh, you basically get everybody, and uh, well, one can quite 
prove that, but you can, what, what is going to happen is that one can show, at least with the present technology, that the exceptional set is very small. So this, uh, this is, this is uh, the idea. So what one does uh, is that you look at the Fourier transform. So we're taking lambda, we take its Fourier transform, and we're getting some kind of exponential sum, uh, which is a function on the circle. And then basically, uh, one studies lambda uh, through this, uh, this <coughs> exponential sum. And the idea is the following. It's to make a subdivision uh, of this. So inverse Fourier transform, you recapture lambda by s. So the idea is that you make a subdivision in major and, mi in, in major and minor arcs by restricting this integral first uh, to uh, neighborhoods, small neighborhoods of uh, rationals with a small denominator. So there is a cutoff parameter there, which is b, and which is typically going to depend on n, right? So you're looking at rationals of the form a over q with q less than b, and then neighborhoods which are of the size b, b over n. So you should look at that as a tiny set, but somehow the idea is that this set is going to have the main contribution. Then there is the rest. So now, uh, what, is this, what is this thing good for? Well, what you do is that when you go back to the, the lambda, which is given as inverse Fourier transform of s, and you restrict this integral to, to the set of major arcs. So then there are several ideas. First of all, uh, what you want to say is that, so this is a new, this is a function lambda 1 of n. Uh, and this lambda 1 of n will tend to be better understood. So the first thing, and this is uh, what they call the control on minor arcs, is that you want to say that lambda n and lambda 1 n uh, are kind of close together. So the usual way to handle it is by looking at, say, uh, well, one way to handle it is by, by looking at the L2 norm of the difference of lambda and lambda 1, uh, which is, of course, by, by Parseval controlled by the L2 norm of S of theta on the complement of the major arcs. So remember that lambda 1 was normalized. So if I would integrate on all of the circle, I would have 1 over n. So the idea is that if you, if you kick out these this major arcs, and this is, of course, not always true, but in the... <laughs> Uh, in the situations where we can play this game, this is what happens. You get something which is small with respect to 1 over n. So roughly, uh, what it means is that uh, whatever you get in the support of lambda 1, uh, this is not going to differ too much from what you get in the support of lambda. And the, the difference is an error here, which is going to be uh, of the, well, in terms of size of, of support, uh, is going to be of the, of the size n epsilon. So depending on how small you're going to take epsilon, this is going to add some, uh, some, uh, some error there, and it may be the only error. Now, I don't exclude that, uh, say, even lambda 1 is not known to have a full support, or say the, the set R1 uh, not necessarily being all of, of 1 up to n. But at least uh, what's going to happen there, that's the idea of restricting to these major arcs, is that we will have some kind of better understanding of what happens there. So this lambda 1n, which is an integral on a very small set just near neighbors, uh, neighborhoods, small neighborhoods of, uh, of small rationals, uh, well, um, what is typically going on is that the, the, the lambda 1n is kind of going to factor as a product of densities. So you will have an Archimedean density, which is sigma n, uh, sorry, which is pi n, which is just, uh, uh, in, in that case, would be of the order of, of 1 over n. And then somehow there is a factorization, uh, which comes from factoring this, this model IQ, uh, that leads to a representation, basically a representation in a product of, of local densities. And so the reason why we can do that is that we uh, want, in some sense, to have a very good understanding of... Uh, of say this, this function of this initial distribution lambda of n uh, from um, say a modular point of view uh, when we are taking the, the modulus sufficiently small. So when, we, when, when we're looking, basically we have to understand uh, what is uh, lambda of the set of integers less than n uh, which has a prescribed congruence condition, say, uh, to be equal to, to a mod q, provided q is not too large. Once we have this understanding, we have an, uh, a good, uh, a good, we get a good description of what happens on major arcs. So 
uh, let me recall you that there is a parameter b involved. And so on one hand, this understanding here is going to be easier when b is small, because we're taking very small neighborhoods of rationals with very small denominator. On the other hand, if b is too small, then the error, the, the epsilon, uh, which we're getting uh, before, this epsilon is going to be, uh, is going to be larger. So the whole thing is kind of a, a compromise between how small, how I mean, how large we can get b to get as small epsilon as possible, and uh, how um, uh, well how large we can uh, choose the b here to have still the control on the major arcs. So no, I mean this is a story that has been repeated over and over again. But let me tell you why, in the context of uh, orbits of groups or semi-groups, we have a chance to carry such a thing out. So first of all, the major arcs. So um, like it's clear from uh, what I just said, uh, basically what we need to understand there is the distribution of the set uh, from an, uh, a modular, in fact, an Archimedean modular point of view but only in a quite modest way, in the sense that uh, we need to know something about the distribution of elements mod Q, where Q is not too large. And it turns out uh, that uh, actually uh, this is possible uh, because of um, spectral methods. So this counting can be performed uh, by uh, basically the Lux Phillips, so either the Lux Phillips theory or uh, other methods, which are going to give you a precise counting uh, in the orbits of these uh, of these uh, uh, of, of these groups, and actually, uh, so what is underlying there is a spectral gap phenomenon that I will recall you and say initially what happened is that uh, we realized that we could uh, well of course you will have the spectral technique also in congruent subgroups of the given group. But what was realized at some point is that uh, this uh, spectral gap can be made uniform in some sense over congruent subgroups. In some sense, what we, get, what we got was an extension of Selberg's theorem. And so somehow the, the spectral gap which is involved there, this uniform spectral gap, uh, is, um, uh, is, is quite essential in determining uh, what really can be captured uh, from, from these spectral methods. Now, in the early stages of this theory, we were really doing everything only using the spectral gaps. Now, somehow the new development is that we realized that uh, it was better uh, to, to use only the spectral methods on the major arcs and then start looking for, say, more other techniques, say, in fact, there are more, uh, more robust techniques uh, that can handle the, uh, the minor arcs. So in one, you see, if you don't, on the minor arcs, so we're taking uh, rationals uh, which have much larger denominators, so we don't quite know so much anymore about the distribution for these moduli, so we're looking at other techniques. And so what are really powerful techniques? Powerful in the sense that they don't require you to, uh, to have too much structure. Well, one such technique was developed by Vinogradov, which are, uh, which, uh, are estimates on exponential sums which have a multilinear structure. Uh, so that basically doesn't uh, require you to have any kind of arithmetical input in some sense. We, we really need to know very little. So why can we get uh, such a multilinear structure? Well, we have a semigroup, so we can multiply a semigroup we have a group or a semi-group, so we can multiply elements. And because we can multiply elements, somehow you could expect that uh, there is a hope to get an, uh, a multilinear structure. Uh, in certain other instances, uh, what can be used, although, like I said, this, uh, this group is not uh, what, what my colleague uh, Peter Saranac likes to call is a thin group, which means uh, it's, it's not uh, uh, it's not a finite index subgroup of, of a nice uh, algebraic group in, in any sense. Uh, so um, although this group is combinatorial, it may have some nice subgroups. And we can then exploit these nice subgroups to make estimates on the minor arcs. 
Now, uh, what I want to, to do uh, is give, start by recalling a little bit of these of this spectral uh, methods. Uh, basically, um, there, are, there are two techniques. Uh, the, there is the uh, automorphic technique, say Lux Phillips, and then there is a symbolic uh, technique. So, uh, I will say you something about the... Uh, well, I will give you a little bit of the background and then details, some details around the, uh, the automorphic methods. And I will not say too much about the, the, the symbolic techniques which are, uh, which are more complicated. Uh, the, the idea is the following. Essentially, like I said, you, you want to do a counting. Uh, eventually, you have this... Uh, so, basically, the subgroups, I should have said that, it was on, on, the, on the slide, but anyway, so the, the groups are, they are either sitting in SL2 Z or SL2 uh, over the Gauss integer. So we have to do some kind of counting in orbits. So basically the easiest thing is to have generating functions which are, uh, which are constructed using the group elements themselves. And then we, uh, we basically count them for an Archimedean, uh, for an Archimedean norm. Just uh, the problem. So the point is that uh, this can be to so then the question is, is if, if you're taking uh, such, a, uh, such a subgroup uh, lambda uh, of SL2z or uh, SL2 of the Gauss integers, this is the story for, for uh, SL2. Uh, SL2. Uh, if, you, if you are in the situation SL3, then you have to replace H2 by H3. So there is a completely anal analogous theory in, uh, uh, in, in H3, which is what would be involved if you study subgroups of, the, uh, uh, of SL2 uh, over, the, over the, the Gauss integers, as is going to be the case, say, for these Apollonian packings. Anyway, basically, the, this observation uh, reduces you the, the issue of reduces the issue to doing some kind of hyperbolic uh, counting uh, where we are looking, trying to, to know exactly with an asymptotic formula what is the number of elements G, say, in that given uh, subgroup uh, which lie within a uh, ball which is defined with this norm here uh, of radius uh, whatever t and then we can further also impose well we can impose certain congruence conditions but imposing these congruence conditions amounts to restricting the element g to the congruent subgroups of uh, the the given the given subgroup now uh, what is the interest of um, uh, of looking at it from that point of view well there is a theory uh, which tells you how to handle that so let me remind you uh, the, the background. So what we're going to do is take a finitely generated subgroup of SL2z or SL2 over the Gauss integers. And uh, what we assume is that uh, it is uh, non-elementary in the sense that, uh, well, the, the limit set, so you have a limit set for this group, that it has a dimension, so in the, in the SL2 case, so it will have a dimension uh, which is, uh, what we assume is that we have a dimension which is uh, strictly positive. So it's going to be typically uh, less than one because we are looking at a thin group. Uh, if you are in the SL3 case, then the one has to be, sorry, sorry, <laughs> uh, replace the, I'm blocking your view, of course. I don't know what, what side of this uh, machinery should stand from, I don't know, left or right? I can change so that this everybody gets it. Uh, uh, so um, uh, in, in that case uh, of SL3, uh, the delta is going to be between 0 and 2. So there is an, uh, a critical uh, level there, uh, which is, uh, so in the two case it's a half, in the three case it's 1. So what happens is that uh, if delta is more than a half, you have an L2 spectral theory. And so you can use this uh, Lux Phillips uh, technique to do a counting, uh, which gives you an asymptotic formula where the leading term is basically given by the, by the, the lowest eigenvalue, as we will see in a moment. So these are more analysis methods. 
so the Lux Phillips theory basically reduces the issue to having a spectral gap in some sense, which is then a separate issue. When delta is one half or less than one half, you don't have an L2 spectral theory anymore, so things there is going to be a little bit more uh, difficult, but you have an, um, uh, you still have the so-called thermodynamical, the symbolic approach. And so in the symbolic approach, we are not talking about spectral gaps of uh, the Laplacian, but we're talking about zero free regions of the resolvent. And uh, uh, basically, um, well, this is a theory that has been developed over the years, and the new input is that somehow in this theory, we can incorporate an additional modular point of view. So we are taking, I uh, will not say too much about that, uh, uh, what we succeed in doing uh, is uh, extending the, the main object which governs this thermodynamical approach, which is the Ruel transfer operator, you kind of find an extension of this Ruel transfer operator into the modular setting where we can capture the modulus in, in a uniform way, and then we are getting uh, uniform control of, uh, uh, of, the, of the zero free region of this resolvent. So this plays very much the role of, of what is done with the spectral gap and the Lux-Phillips theory. So this is more complicated. They will not get too much in that. Uh, but okay, um, in the, the advan certainly the advantage of the second method is that we don't really need the full group. So it's, it's more local. Uh, and in particular, this, this second technique, this thermodynamic uh, technique, applies also in the semi-group setting. While I don't know how to apply, say, the, the first kind of techniques when you have a semi-group setting. So if we're talking about uh, uh, the Zaremba problem, for instance, there we typically have a semi-group setting uh, where we, um, uh, we don't really have, uh, all, although the semi-group is quite sick in some sense, we don't really have access to these automorphic methods. So let me remind you what is the Lux Phillips setting. So we have, uh, what happens is that uh, we can look at a ribbon surface uh, which is obtained by coating H by lambda, and then we're taking the functions F which are invariant uh, under the, the action of uh, the group lambda. And we're looking at uh, the, um, the spectrum of that. So like I said, uh, you, in, in that case, uh, we can exploit an L2 spectral theory because, uh, well, the, the lowest eigenvalue, uh, lambda zero, uh, which is delta one minus delta, where delta is the, is the dimension of the limit set, uh, is going to be separated from the, the rest of the, of the spectrum. So in the beginning, you have, uh, you, you're getting here uh, point spectrum, and then above here you're going to have continuous spectrum. But what's important is that between lambda zero and lambda one, there is this gap. Now, why is this important? Well, there is an um, there is a result by Lux and Phillips, which is kind of exploiting uh, uh, two sides of the picture. There is a say a PDE point of view, which turns, which evolves around the wave equation, and there is a geometric. Uh, point of view, and uh, what that allows you to do uh, is expressing a counting. So we're, we're talking about this hyperbolic counting. So we fix some element w0 in H, and then, in fact, in our case, w0 and, and w should be, should be I, say. And then you're looking at, you're counting all the elements gamma in lambda with the property that uh, the hyperbolic distance from gamma uh, w0 to, to, to w is bounded by S. So that would, in some sense, uh, give you uh, the elements gamma for which that uh, the Frobenius norm is bounded by the exponential of S, right? So the point is that if you look at this formula, uh, you're getting some terms here which come from the, the, from the, the discrete spectrum. There is an, an extra term here, but even in this first sum, uh, the, leading, the, the leading contribution really comes uh, from uh, delta zero. So there, there is a relation between lambda, you, you define delta g by this formula, and so you see that the, the main contribution is going to come from this lambda zero, assuming that there is a certain gap between lambda zero and lambda one. So if we can establish that uh, you have uh, this gap, then basically you get a very precise uh, evaluation, which is that uh, contribution of the, of the lowest mode, 
which will give you n at the power to delta up, there's an, an absolute constant here. Uh, and then something which is not only smaller, but you're going to have some power gain uh, be because the, the delta 1 is going to be really separated from the delta 0. And well, we'd like to have this phenomenon as uniform as possible. And in particular, we need to have this phenomenon. So we have this phenomenon in the, in the given uh, group lambda, but we also have to understand this phenomenon uh, in the in the congruent subgroups of, uh, of this lambda because we need to do the counting not only for this Archimedean uh, norm, but well, I mean, also when we impose restrictions on, on gamma, which are of, an, of a modular uh, kind. So what we also want to, to be able to count are the, is the number of the gammas, uh, which are in lambda q, uh, where lambda q are the elements of uh, lambda which are the identity mode q and which have a norm which is bounded by n. So, of course, for each individual q, we still have this, this, this formula, but then we want to know how this gap is going to evolve with q. And this is exactly uh, the point of extending Selberg's theorem to this, uh, to this thin groups. So, the, in the Selberg theorem, the lambda is just all of SL to z. And then, well, how does this gap behave? Well, it is uniform over Q. And um, what Selberg proved is that uh, it's at least uh, 3 over 16. In, uh, in fact, the conjecture is that it should be at least equal to 1 quarter, which means that in the picture I was giving you before, uh, you don't have this. Um, oh. Let's see, you don't have this, uh, uh, sorry, you don't have this uh, exceptional eigenvalues there. So, um, <laughs> what is the, one important input um, is the uh, development of a Selberg theorem, an analog of Selberg theorem for thin groups in SL2Z. So, we have the same setup. Uh, we have this lambda finitely generated uh, non-elementary in SL2Z, and we are taking the congruent subgroups uh, lambda Q of lambda. If we quotient H over lambda Q, we are getting a bigger Riemann surface because there are more functions which are going to be invariant under the action of lambda Q. So because we get more functions, there is a chance of spoiling spectral gaps. Well, there is one, uh, so first of all, what I will assume is that, again, delta lambda is bigger than a half, otherwise this story falls apart. And so uh, there's an easy observation is that the bus note remains the same. The problem is what happens uh, with the, um, uh, let's see. The problem is what happens with the next one. So what we proved is that the next one, lambda 1 of lambda q, is going to be separated from lambda 0 by some epsilon, which is independent of q and is going to depend, of course, possibly on lambda. Uh, in principle, this epsilon is effective, but it is quite small. So at the time, well, uh, we were trying to, to play. In fact, when, when the, the delta is getting close to a half, there is an, um, an explicit result by uh, Alex Gambert, which allows you to, to make precise statements. But still, uh, somehow, the, the use of the spectral gap in the type of, of thing uh, I'm, I'm talking about, say we're talking about the level of distribution in some sense, uh, it's quite restrictive. Uh, in any case, uh, the presence of such, the existence of such a spectral gap is still quite enough to deal with uh, major arcs in the applications I'm going to discuss. And so we are definitely using uh, that result in a quite uh, crucial way. One, uh, well, one comment about the proof, here we are talking about a geometric spectral gap. Now, if you take the L2 space on H mod lambda Q with a little bit of, of uh, abuse of um, uh, language, in some sense, you can view it as the L2 H mod lambda with some vector valued extension. And this vector valued extension, it's roughly the, the Hilbert space over SL2 Q. 
I mean, in kind of trying to summarize the, the proof of this, of this result, is a joint, uh, joint paper with Alex Gambert and Peter Sarnak. So uh, what turns out is that if something goes wrong with the spectral gap, uh, it really has to happen in this extension SL2, SL, uh, L2, SL2Q, which eventually amounts to saying that something is going to go wrong uh, with the spectral gap in the Cayley graph on SL2Q, uh, which is induced by, by S. So this argument, which is not, uh, not a complete triviality, I would have to explain it, it would take an hour, uh, but the, the point is that we can reduce the problem of the geometric spectral gap to the combinatorial spectral gap uh, in these uh, Cayley graphs, for which are now very well understood. So uh, what we know uh, is that so we, we, we do the, the reduction mod Q, we have the, um, the, uh, the strong approximation principle that will give you uh, something which is on to, and then we have the Cayley graphs. Uh, which are induced by that set S, and what we have uh, are so-called expander families, and we get these uniform spectral gaps, uniform uh, in the sense that uh, they are uniform over Q, that eventually translate in these uniform, uh, uniform geometric spectral gaps that I was describing here. So the consequences then, from what I said before, is that we get not only a good Archimedean counting, but also imposing modular restrictions uh, with a leading term and then an error term. Now what's important about this error term is that it's with a power gain. So the epsilon is a spectral gap. There is an effect of Q, of course, but because there's an epsilon gain here, you can take Q quite large. And you can take the Q as large as the power of N, uh, which is kind of nice. And well, uh, because of this issue about the uniform uh, uh, the, the strong approximation property, we have to assume that Q is co-prime with a given fixed modulus Q0. Now, if Q is not co-prime with Q0, there is, an, there is another formula possible uh, that uh, also gives you an, uh, a description. Now, um, before I go to that, let me tell you that uh, in the other case, so now what happens when, when delta is a half or less than a half? Well, you don't have that anymore, but you still can produce a formula for the, for the Archimedean counting uh, using these thermodynamical techniques uh, and the Revelle transfer operator, uh, which, um, well, at the time it was just a main term and then something which is little of the main term, but then these things have been developed further. Uh, this is an important input by uh, people like Dolgo Piat and then No and so on that really have uh, turn this, this, uh, te this technique in something which is very quantitative, again with, uh, with power gains. And then what we had to do was to find some kind of uh, extension of this, of this uh, technique where you also involve a modular uh, restriction here. So we had to modify this Revelle transfer operator, let it act on bigger spaces, and then try to prove that you still have these zero free regions for the resolvent. And uh, in fact, we were not 100% successful there uh, in the sense that uh, we did not quite have the, the power gain, but still we had something which was strong, which is strong enough uh, to be almost as good as, as, this, uh, as this power gain in many applications. And, well, this will affect some of the results I will mention uh, later on. So in some sense, whatever comes, so there is an extra problem here with this modular restriction. So uh, what we didn't really do is try to extend the Dolgopia theory uh, in, the modular, uh, in the modular aspect. So all the information from in this modular aspect comes really from group expansion and it gives something which is uh, slightly weaker. There is another little problem uh, with, um, with, which is different, say, uh, with the symbolic approach. So like I said, if you have a delta here which is close to 1, then you have Gambert's result, which gives you an explicit epsilon. Uh, in the symbolic technique, well, you're going to get uh, some, uh, some asymptotic like that, but whatever the gain, which is going to be quite good, is going to depend on the, on the initial set of generators. So what you may do is take, say, some group or semi-group that looks much bigger. So assume that you are in the, in the context of this Aremba problem. We're taking a semi-group which is much thicker, and we expect that you're going to have a better, a smaller error term in some sense, but we don't know that because it's not really clear. It would be horrendous to try to figure this out. It's how the gain, uh, how the error term, it's really depending there on uh, the initial generator. So this is another difficulty. 
Uh, so the first application, uh, just to illustrate this theory, uh, is the, the problem of understanding Apollonian circle packings. In fact, it is an illustration of the corresponding uh, theory in, uh, in H3. But like I said, these theories are completely analogous and the spectral uh, problem there is going to capture, be captured by this uh, Lax-Phillips uh, techniques uh, applied uh, in, um, in quotients of H3. So for those who are not familiar uh, with it, uh, what we are uh, studying are uh, curvatures of, uh, of circles uh, which are obtained uh, in um, so-called uh, Apollonian circle packings and the, uh, the main point, which is something that was observed by Sodi at the time, is that if we're looking at an um, uh, at the circle packing where the initial three circles, so here you would have uh, the minus 11 is because uh, is because you're going into the interior, so I have uh, this circle, then I have that one, that one, and that one. So we have these uh, four mutually tangent uh, circles. Their curvatures are 11, 24, 21, and 28. They are integers. What happens, uh, I mean, this is not so difficult to see, but anyway, this is a nice observation. Going back to Sodi, is that when you continue filling in the holes with tangent circles using Apollonius, uh, Apollo, uh, Apollonius theorem. So we have here um, the circle, say 24, 21, and minus 11. So are, uh, uh, you're looking at uh, this uh, mutually tangent circle, so you get uh, 28, and then you have a complement here which is 40, and then you can keep going on like that and uh, fill in all the holes. Well, all these circles are going to have uh, integral curvatures. And uh, the question is, what integers are you really getting there? So, um, uh, the uh, problem was studied in a sequence of papers by Graham, Lagarius, Mallow, uh, Mallow, Wilkes, and Jan, and then it was also advertised by uh, Peter Sarnak at uh, various occasions. Uh, this is, in fact, in the beginning that we were st applying these uh, uh, spectral gap results uh, in problems of, of sieving, so we wanted to know uh, whether we got primes in, in, uh, in these orbits and, and things like that. But somehow, the, say, the conjectures uh, which were put forward initially, well, the first conjecture, which is a modest conjecture, uh, is that uh, the um, collections in any, if you take any Apollonian, uh, integral Apollonian circle packing and you're looking at the corresponding curvatures, well, the collection of all these curvatures, they form a set of integers which have positive density. Then you can uh, be more bold. No, I'm not, I think it is formulated also in, uh, in, in the work of these guys, but it was definitely, uh, definitely formulated by Sarnak later on, is that, and I mean, most likely this thing is true, uh, is that you have a local to global principle in the sense that all the integers are produced up to some finite congruence condition. Uh, so uh, I will tell you what is, uh, what is known about that. The first problem has been solved. The first problem is much easier. Uh, the second problem uh, is not solved and it's a little bit on the level of what I said about binary Goldbach is that we don't really know that you can write any integer as a sum of two primes, uh, even integer, but still we know it's true except for uh, a small exceptional set, so this is a little bit uh, the, uh, the same kind of situation here. So what has this to do with uh, the preceding and with orbits of groups? Well, first, this Apollonian group uh, is a subgroup of the orthogonal group uh, corresponding to a quadratic form of signature 3, 1, uh, which is the one I'm writing there. So in other words, what is the vanishing of this quadratic form in four variables? The vanishing of this quadratic form is a necessary and sufficient condition uh, for the circles. Um, so if we have uh, a configuration of uh, circles with radius x1, x2, x3, x4, which are mutually, uh, mutually tangent, then we have uh, the, the vanishing of, uh, of this quadratic form. And um, so basically the way this 
Apollonian, uh, this uh, Apollonian packings work is that we have the initial four curvatures of the basic of, of, the, of the four given Mutri tangent circles. And then we're getting uh, the other curvatures uh, every time by, by taking the, the action of elements in a subgroup A of this orthogonal group, which is called the Apollonian packing group, the action of A uh, on, uh, uh, on what we will call here the root quadruple. So we are acting A on this four tuple here, taking any, any element of A, acting on this four tuple, and we're getting another four tuple, which are also uh, curvatures of circles in the packing associated to these initial circles, and by doing that we're getting everybody. Now what is nice about this Apollonian packing group is that it is finitely generated. So you have four elements here, S1, S2, S3, S4, which are generating this Apollonian packing group. And uh, so now, okay, this, uh, what has this group to do with SL2 over the Gauss integers? Well, under the, so there are two features of this group which are important. If you take the, uh, if you see what happens under the, the spin double cover, you're retrieving this group as the image of a subgroup of SL2 over the Gauss integers, uh, which is finitely generated and which is nice in the sense that it's the dimension of the limit set is going to be bigger than one. Remember, if we are in the H3 in, the, in, in that situation, the one half has to be replaced by one. So what Boyd showed is that in fact you have an, uh, a group uh, of dimension exactly, exactly that, so it's more than one. That corresponds to the host of dimension of the, the host of dimension of the, residu of the residual area in, uh, uh, in, in any given packing. So spectral methods apply, which is already good, but still the, the, the group is, is not very sick, right? Because we're far, far away from, from two, so I mean, it wouldn't be possible to use Gambert's result, for instance. Uh, that's one feature. Then there is another feature, although this group is certainly a, a thin group and it's a combinatorial group, there are subgroups which are very nice because uh, what turns out is that the groups generated by uh, these uh, particular elements, uh, so you take S1, S2, uh, S3, any three of them, uh, turns out that these groups are arithmetic and their orbits uh, can be described by binary quadratic forms. Now, if you have to prove things about sets of integers which are kind of produced by uh, arithmetic objects like uh, binary quadratic forms, you are in quite good shape. And uh, so in whatever I'm talking about, there are the two aspects. There is a spectral aspect and there is this presence of uh, arith small arithmetic subgroups which are both going to be important. So uh, what are the results? Well, there is a following result obtained in the thesis of Elena Fuchs. Uh, so by the, the strong approximation property, uh, we know that if we do a reduction mod Q, we are going to take, we're going to get everybody, provided Q is uh, with a um, certain integer. So what, we, what had to be understood there is what are precisely these, uh, these exceptional places. So it turns out that uh, what she proved is that uh, the only problems come at, uh, at 2 and at, uh, at 3. So in some sense, what we know in terms of local obstruction, what, what uh, we're getting there uh, tells, tells us what are the possible uh, local obstructions. So they appear uh, at, uh, at 2 and at, uh, at 3. So uh, what we showed first using uh, mainly uh, the, the subgroups uh, which uh, produce this, uh, these binary quadratic forms and uh, using also a representation of integers by families of, of uh, binary quadratic forms, what we proved is that this positive density conjecture holds. Uh, this is a joint paper with Fuchs. And then later with Kontorovic, uh, we use some of these techniques, but combined also with the spectral theory to prove more and show that we have actually the local to global principle uh, in the sense that we're getting everybody which is admitted 
from the local point of view with a possible exceptional set uh, which is small in the sense that we get a power gain here. Of course we would very much like not to have this problem but the difficulty somehow to um, explain the difficulty it is basically the same level uh, as trying to prove well that that's what we feel maybe we are wrong that there are other there is something smarter to do there but uh, basically on the level of, of doing binary gold back with, with what we know to do now so um, why uh, how is this uh, put into work uh, well, uh, what we're doing is trying, so remember the circle method I was talking about creating a generating function. And I want to create a generating function so that I can as well exploit the spectral theory as, as well that as the additional structure. Well, in that case, uh, in order to treat the minor arcs, what I want to, to be able to exploit are these arithmetic subgroups. So what I'm doing here is that a factor T, so we want to, we're looking at L at integers, so basically elements which are bounded by T, and we're factoring T as a product of T0 and uh, X square for some reason. T0 is going to be very small, small power of T. Then there is X square, which is the main thing. So why do I write X square? Well, here I'm going to introduce special elements in my Apollonian group, which are obtained from one of these arithmetic subgroups. And say, for your information, the way they appear, what, what only matters here is, is, the, is the bottom row. What I'm getting here are quadratic forms in X and Y. Then, uh, so we are putting here, we are multiplying. So we use the, the group structure here. So we are multiplying with a gamma, which is in, in a ball of radius T0, in a full ball. So here we can exploit the spectral, spectral aspects. Uh, we're taking T0 small, it doesn't matter, so small power of, of, uh, of T is, is going to suffice. So we let this operate on the root quadruple. So what we're getting here are quadruples of curvatures that will appear in the corresponding uh, integral Apollonian circle packing and we're just picking out the, the, the fourth coordinate. So what we are producing here are curvatures in this packing. And uh, what it turns out is that this is a good combination. Now, why is this a good combination? Well, on one hand, we're having the Xy, which is completely explicit. These are quadratic forms in X and Y, and we can use that to estimate the minor arcs. Note that one quadratic, fo uh, one quadratic form wouldn't quite do it, because you only have two variables. But because there's also the gamma there, we really have a family of quadratic forms, and this is enough to get the, the control which is needed on the minor arcs. On the other hand, we also have to control exactly what happens on the major arcs, and this is why we have the gamma here. So the gamma is restricted to a full ball for which you have this precise Lux-Phillips counting uh, and the extension to the model setting. So the, the control of what exactly happens on the major arcs comes from having uh, the, the presence of, of this, this gamma. And then, well, one one can play with, with that and uh, eventually uh, one gets a power saving, but the, whatever estimates we have are very, very far from being able to prove that we would get everybody. So we can get an error term, which is just small uh, in, in an L2 sense with the power gain, and there it's more or less uh, where, uh, uh, where it stops what we have there for the, for the moment. So this is uh, one application. Um, the, the other application, so this was an application of the, um, of the, the theory in the, in the group setting. What I want to um, describe you next is an application in the semi-group setting, which is rather natural, uh, which is to, um, uh, to Zaremba's uh, conjecture. And, uh, well, this has to do with uh, understanding rationals that have uh, bounded partial quotients. So uh, the problem that was initially motivated by some uh, more applied considerations, uh, what um, Zaremba conjectured is that if I give you a modulus, so let me go back one, uh, one place, if I give you um, any uh, integer d, uh, it is possible to find a B which is co-prime with D and such that 
the fraction uh, b over d has um, partial quotients which are bounded by capital A, uh, where capital A, well, he conjectured, could be taken equal to 5. And then there are other versions of this conjecture which, were, which are more bold, uh, with an A equals 3 or even an A equals 2, provided uh, we take D sufficiently large, so up to an, uh, a finite number of, uh, of uh, exceptions. Uh, this problem is uh, still open. Uh, there has been work by Niederreiter proving this conjecture for very special uh, choices of, uh, of, of D, uh, techniques that do not seem to extend in general. So the, the work with Contour, which is in some sense uh, a statement which comes reasonably close uh, to, um, to the truth that, again, we managed to prove such results uh, allowing a very small set of uh, exceptions. I should maybe start by telling you why Zaremba uh, introduced this problem. It has to do with distribution, good distributions of points. So uh, basically, if you are in one dimension and you want to distribute n points as well as you can, there aren't 36 ways to do it. But if you are in two dimensions, it's not so clear how you're going to, to, put, to choose these points. Basically, what you want to do is minimize the discrepancy, which is the maximum of the difference uh, between the area of an uh, of, an, um, of, a, of, of, of some sub-rectangle uh, with the relative number of points in my set that fall into this rectangle. Note we are not only taking, uh, we are not only taking uh, squares, we are taking uh, general uh, rectangles. And uh, in dimension two, uh, there is an... So you can't do this too, too well. In fact, in uh, dimension two, uh, there is a result by Schmidt which tells you that there is some limitation of how well you can distribute points. And the best discrepancy, well, the optimal discrepancy is log n over n. So this is any choice. Well, no matter how you choose the points, this discrepancy is going to be bigger than log n over n. So what Zaremba showed is that you could realize this log n over n by arithmetical techniques. By doing the following, uh, what you're doing is uh, you're taking uh, some d, and uh, a b, which is co-prime uh, with d, and such that uh, the partial quotients of b over d are bounded by a. Then you're taking the following sequence in the unit square. You're taking j over d, and then you take bj over d, where bj is, re is, is reduced mod d. So you get d points. You're getting d points in the square. And it turns out that these points are reasonably well distributed because the discrepancy is bounded by that same quantity, which is log d over d, up to a factor. And uh, this, uh, this factor uh, is going to, to be controlled in terms of a, which brings in the uh, significance of uh, Diophantine information about, uh, about the fraction uh, b over d. This is also a problem that appears in uh, the context of pseudo-randomness uh, because if we are looking at a special case of the linear congruential pseudo-random number generator, uh, which is obtained by multiplying with b mod d and no translation, so if we would take d prime and we take b a primitive uh, element uh, mod d, then uh, we can start looking, so we're getting a sequence of d elements. Here we take b power j over d reduced mod 1. Uh, study the distribution of, of the sequence and also studying the distribution. What's more, even more important is to study the so, the so called distribution of the pairs of consecutive elements, what they call the serial correlation for pairs. Now, if I assume that my b is, is primitive mod, mod d, then this b at the power j basically gives me everything, all the residues mod d. And so the, the discrepancy of that sequence is controlled just as the same as the discrepancy of the, of the set x uh, that I introduced uh, before. So uh, we want to, well, we are interested in, uh, for instance, in producing uh, prime numbers uh, d and for which we have an element b which is primitive mod d and such that uh, that uh, the partial quotients of b over d would be bounded by uh, by some by, 
by some fixed constant a. These are pictures which were produced by my co-author. I have no idea how he produced uh, Well, actually, it's probably not too hard to produce that. Uh, but you see uh, that this is this is an it's it's really true what um, what, what Zaremba is claiming because here you have uh, uh, some um, instance of a b over d where the partial quotients are really small they, they are they are bounded by three and when you look at this uh, the distribution say for the serial correlation you get something that really looks like quite well distributed on the other hand. Uh, if you look at, so this is, um, uh, again here we have a prime number, we have a primitive uh, numerator, but now a b over d, which has some large partial quotients. And right away you see that this distribution is, is much less nice. So this uh, estimate of Zaremba really reflects uh, the, the, the true um, uh, behavior uh, that, uh, that you can see, say, on, uh, on pictures. So, um, what are the results? I think then I probably will stop soon and uh, we'll discuss then what we do after that. Uh, so, with Kontorovitz, what we showed is that uh, if we take A equals 50, uh, dA is a set of density 1 and even in a more quantitative form. Uh, in particular, the error term, well, the error term can even be improved. Note this 1 over log log, and this is, because we are using the thermodynamical method, this is just the shortcoming that came in the, because of the, of the zero free, uh, um, resonant free region in the modular aspect, which is not quite uniform, but slowly deteriorates, so this has an effect there, but there is, there is a chance, well, one can do better and maybe one can even get a power saving there. Uh, in any case, uh, that result was improved further by a student of uh, uh, Alex Kontorovic who obtains the same, who proved the same thing. Now, instead of A equals 50, he got A equals 5. And in any case, because we have a, a very small exceptional set here, what is possible, for instance, if you look at uh, R51, uh, for instance, you will get infinitely many fractions b over d, where d is prime and uh, b is, an, uh, is, a, is, is a primitive root mod d. Uh, so the uh, result is stated for the, the linear uh, pseudo-congruential uh, number generator is valid uh, for, uh, for that, uh, that this particular uh, multiplier b. The, uh, well, the, what is really where does this really fit in? Well, uh, you see, the role of the, of the group and the semi-group, it's just how you produce uh, such, uh, such creatures. So if you want to produce elements, uh, rationals B over D, with uh, small with bounded partial quotients, uh, what you do is the following, basically writing, the, fracture, the partial quotient of B over D is given by A1, AK. Um, this is the same as writing down an, e an equality of, of this kind uh, about uh, matrices. They are not, uh, well, they are determinant. Uh, determinant is, uh, is minus one, but you can turn it by taking even, uh, you can turn it into uh, determinants which are one. So, I mean, I shouldn't call it SL2Z. But basically, what you have here is, is roughly speaking, behaves like a uh, semi-group of SL2Z. And then what we want to do is extract, uh, we want to understand, say, uh, how many elements D we can produce as the lower right corner of such products. So the products, they, they don't form a group, they only form a semi-group. I like to study uh, that and uh, we like to take A large. Why do we like to take A large? Because that, in some sense, there is a counterpart of this dimension delta of the group. And this counterpart here is just the dimension of the counter set of um, real numbers between 0 and 1 that have continued fraction expansion bounded by A. So here we are not talking about rational numbers. We're going to the limit. We're taking uh, the full set of real numbers between 0 and 1 with partial quotients bounded by capital A. So these are Cantor sets. In, uh, so these Cantor sets have been studied, in fact, also with the thermodynamical method in particular, 
by Jen uh, Jenkinson Polycott, who got the precise dimension of the uh, Cantor set that corresponds to A equals 2. And what's important for us is a result of Hensley that tells me that when A is large, this, this dimension delta A is going to get close to 1. So in some sense, the role of this delta A, it's very much like the delta of the limit set in the, in the uh, case of uh, subgroups of, uh, of SL2Z. So uh, what we do is that uh, we're producing the Ds by taking the right lower corner and then the action of, of GA. And, uh, well, I'd like to follow the previous scheme. And how do we do that? Well, uh, we're not going to take a full ball because then we don't have a multilinear structure. What we're going to take is a product of balls because we have a semi-group. A product of balls that allows me on the minor arcs uh, to do Vinogradov. Note that in order to, well, you can always do this Vinogradov thing, but in order to gain enough, it's absolutely essential that delta is very close to 1. And that even is, okay, Vinogradov standard trivial, but somehow it's not completely trivial there. So if you really want to get enough, you have to work a little bit. This is, in fact, something we did before in the group setting, so it's kind of reproducing these arguments. Uh, so this is general. You don't use the, the group structure. We're just using the fact that we have big subsets of, of balls in SL2Z in some sense, but we need this, this product structure. And then on the, on the major arcs, of course, we are again uh, exploiting the spectral methods, but now through the, uh, the uh, symbolic approach, because we have a semigroup. So even though the semigroup is very thick, we can't apply the Lux Phillips because we don't uh, have the automorphic uh, we don't have a group, so we can't use uh, this, this automorphic technique. But we can use the spectral, we can use the symbolic technique as was used before in the study of this candle set. And um, the information we are getting is sufficient. But note that uh, what you would expect is that when the A is getting larger because the semi group is getting bigger in some sense, then we are better off on the level of the major arcs. Uh, simply because we are expecting this, uh, this uh, zero free region of the resolvent to get better and better. Unfortunately, we don't know that. Because this whole story is messy and complicated enough that it's absolutely unclear, it would be a nightmare to track this down, of how things eventually depend on A. So on one hand, we have to take uh, A sufficiently large in order to supply the estimates for the minor arcs, but the effect is that somehow on the level of this, uh, we could have something which is getting worse. So this is a little catch. And this is also going to be uh, apparent in the next application. I will not, I will stop here uh, unless people are desperate to hear more, but I guess I have to, uh, to stop here. Maybe I will continue then the next time and I will uh, describe you an, another application of this um, this uh, study of, uh, of um, uh, in fact, it will be uh, quadratic irrationals, uh, the study of uh, this uh, uh, bounded partial quotient uh, uh, constructions uh, in uh, the context of, uh, of Duke's theorem, where, in some sense, we are uh, showing uh, the limitations of, uh, of Duke's uh, Icky distribution theorem, but really I think I should stop here and then uh, we will continue with, uh, with that uh, next time, uh, which um, is uh, basically the, the last application, which is going to be an application of sieving, in fact, to, uh, to low-lying uh, geodesics. So I will postpone that until next time, maybe. So, okay, that's it. People were very nice, they didn't interrupt me, so they can ask questions. Okay. I have a nice question. So in the semi-group thing, what happens if you look at the group generated by the matrix list? Well, you probably get everything, right? I would imagine. You probably get everything, I would say. I mean, we didn't really, we didn't really study it in detail, but likely, I think Alex told, told me once, uh, uh, well, if you would have, uh, I'm trying to think, say, Presumably, the group is going to be everything. Right. 
it's only yes. oh, yeah, you're going yeah. to be everything. Um, but yeah, if you really, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. But yeah, yeah. If I have to guess, I, yeah, no, no, that's I think it's clear, it's clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it doesn't Soon really, one one, though, it doesn't really tell you too much. In fact, what we were hoping is to find a trick to reduce this uh, the semi-group case to the group case, mm. which would have made our life much easier. But then eventually we gave up, and so since there is anyway the, the other technique, the symbolic technique that works for semi-groups, let's just apply here. But there are certain drawbacks of that, and this will be apparent in, in the next thing I'm going to talk about. Any other question? Then if not, then we thank you again.